Please open your Bibles to Colossians chapter 1. And in the Pew Bible, you'll find that on page 1168. Now, last week, we saw Paul exalt Christ as the preeminent Lord over all and encourage the Colossians to stick with the hope of the gospel that they had heard and of which Paul became a minister. Today, he will describe his labors for the gospel. Now, as we prepare for today's text, I'd like you to consider the following. Among others with similar quotes, Elizabeth Elliot said, Nothing is worth living for unless it is worth dying for. And many of you are probably aware that Elizabeth Elliot's husband, Jim Elliot, was killed trying to make missionary contact with an unreached tribe in eastern Ecuador. And she later then spent two years as a missionary to the tribe members who had killed her husband. There is nothing worth living for unless it is worth dying for. And perhaps that sounds like a noble idea. You might also think of Patrick Henry, give me liberty or give me death. Or on Memorial Day weekend, those who have died protecting the freedoms that we enjoy. Sadly, much of the Christian world has lost sight of this idea because we struggle to process suffering. So we can be surprised with the way that the New Testament writers talk about suffering. Peter calls it a gracious thing when we endure, a blessing, and it is the example Christ set for us. Paul says it's the evidence that we are heirs, leads to our glory. It's a way to have fellowship with Christ. And in today's text, it is something to be rejoiced over as an expected part of genuine gospel ministry. Well, let's see what Paul has to say today as we read Colossians chapter 1, verse 24 through chapter 2, verse 5. Colossians 1, 24 through 2, 5. This is God's word. Now, I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is, the church, and of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known. The mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. For I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not seen me face to face, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge." I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. For though I am absent in body, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the firmness of your faith in Christ. Amen. Praise God for his word to us. Now, the way that we're going to break this down is to look at aspects of a gospel ministry. But that does not mean that this is only for pastors or people in professional ministry. We are all called to ministry for the gospel. When we commit to raise our children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, which you've all agreed to participate in today, we're committing to a gospel ministry. 
And then, of course, we have applications of the Great Commission and how we're to relate to our neighbors and the way that we do business and so forth. So our outline today includes four headings as four aspects of a gospel ministry. This is not an exhaustive list. It is just what we see in our text today. And so they are, first, the suffering of gospel ministry. Second, the proclamation of gospel ministry. Third, the hard work of gospel ministry. And fourth, the fruit of gospel ministry. So our first heading is the suffering of gospel ministry. And we're looking at verses 24 and 25 here. And these verses, especially the idea of filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions, I think, are rather difficult to interpret. So we'll first look at what it definitely does not mean, and that will eliminate some interpretive possibilities. And then I'll explain to you how I'm understanding this, and we'll see what implications that has for us. So first, what this definitely does not mean. Based on what we have already seen in Colossians, there is no way in this context that Paul could be suggesting that Christ was in any way insufficient. He is the preeminent, all-sufficient Christ. It can't mean that his sacrifice was insufficient or his sufferings or his atoning work were in any way insufficient. We've already seen that verse 12, believers have been qualified to share in the inheritance. Verse 20, that Christ is reconciling all things on earth or in heaven. And verse 21 and 22, he has reconciled you all by the blood of his cross. If this was in any way insufficient, then you would require a Jesus and something, or Jesus plus. But what we have seen up to this point in Colossians is that it is Jesus plus nothing. To describe Jesus' afflictions as insufficient would be contrary to the theme of this letter. And therefore, it also cannot mean that Paul's suffering has any atoning or saving significance for the Colossians or the church in general. Now let's look at what we can be certain of here. First, Paul is experiencing suffering, and it is for the sake of or the benefit of the Colossians, and more broadly, the sake of Christ's body, which is the church. Second, Paul views his relationship to the Colossians and the body of Christ as that of a minister. Now that probably makes us think of pastor, but the word here is diakonos, in which we get deacon. It means one who serves, a servant. So he is a servant of the body, according to the stewardship or the plan of God that was given to him, and it was given to him for you. The Colossians specifically, and the body generally. So he's made a servant, according to the plan of God, for the Colossians, and then the end of verse 25 gives us the purpose of this service, and it is to make the word of God fully known. Third, we are reminded again of the vital link between Christ and his body. Verse 18 made it clear that he is the head, the church is the body. And in this vital link, Jesus so closely identifies with his people that in a sense, he suffers when they suffer. You can think of Paul's own conversion. He's persecuting the church, and Jesus shows up and says, why are you persecuting me? And this is why Paul can identify his sufferings with Christ's afflictions. So let's put this all together. The suffering 
that Paul experiences comes in the relation to him fulfilling the service given to him by God's plan to make the word of God fully known to the Colossians and others. And the primary way that his suffering has been a benefit for them or was for their sake is that through his sufferings, they had heard and received the gospel, the word of God. In other words, if Paul clings to comfort and refuses to suffer, the gospel will not come to them. And so he rejoices in his sufferings because it has led to the salvation of Epaphras, who then carried the gospel to Colossae. Now, what is still lacking? The inevitable suffering, trial, difficulty that will come with taking the gospel to the ends of the earth. The expansion of the kingdom of God through the spread of the gospel will result in suffering, in trial, in difficulty. And this should be expected. Verse 21, apart from the gospel, people are alienated and hostile in mind. Additionally, Jesus told the apostles that it would be this way. Matthew 24, 9, they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Now, what does this mean for us? If, like in verse 10, you would be walking worthy of the Lord, engaging in gospel ministry, you can expect a measure of suffering, sacrifice, and difficulty to come along with it. People without the gospel are alienated and hostile in mind. Now, they might be your kind and generous neighbor, but their sin nature is alienated from the life of God and their mind hostile toward the gospel and bowing in submission to Lord Jesus. Your afflictions at times may be something as simple as some awkward moments, strained relationships. Some, maybe you, will be called to risk your life for the gospel. It could be the sacrifice of moving to a place with little gospel presence or taking a lower-paying job because of the opportunities that it affords for the gospel. The presence of suffering is an aspect of gospel ministry. It doesn't mean that God has abandoned you. And as it advances the gospel, it is a benefit to those who receive the gospel. But there's also the way that we suffer. Paul rejoices in his sufferings for the sake of the gospel. The way that we suffer can advance the gospel, even if we aren't engaged in some kind of foreign missions or formalized evangelistic work. Has your faith ever been encouraged by the way that you've seen a fellow believer suffer. We have many examples here in our own church community of those who have grown in faith while suffering through cancer, chronic pain, and tragedy. Scripture says that suffering produces endurance. Endurance produces character and character hope. And within the unity of the body, when one suffers in physical ways and their faith grows, others may be built up and grow in prayer, in service, in compassion, and so on. Today, most view suffering as a curse, and we work hard to keep it out of our lives. And we are certainly not suggesting that we masochistically seek suffering. We could say that if we find that our life is full of comfort, or comfort becomes, becomes an idol, 
And we may not be as effective as we might be with the gospel. Let's move to our second heading, the proclamation of gospel ministry. We're in verses 25b through 28. Now, this is the second heading we see of gospel ministry, proclamations, preaching, uh, teaching, telling. Now, there's a commonly cited quote that is falsely attributed to St. Francis of Assisi, preach the gospel at all times, if necessary, use words. Now, at its best, This quote suggests to us that we should always be engaged in living for Christ, that the gospel has implications for how we live in every area of life. Since, as we saw last time, Jesus is Lord over every area of life. And there must be an agreement between what we preach, what we say, and the way that we live. That's all good. The problem that I have with this is that the gospel is news. It's good news. I can't live the six o'clock news. I can read the news. I can tell the news. I can write about the news. I can make changes in my life and live in light of the news, but I can't live the news. I think it's the same with the gospel. I can read the gospel. I can tell the gospel. I can write about the gospel. I can make changes in my life and live in light of the gospel, but properly, I can't Live the gospel. This is why Paul says what he says in Romans 10. How will they call on him in whom they've not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? Skipping down. So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. And there is no little footnote at the bottom that says, or someone lives the gospel in their vicinity. So gospel ministry must include proclamation, preaching, teaching, telling of some kind. At the end of verse 25, this was the service that Paul received from God to make the word of God fully known. And this involves the disclosure of a mystery. And this is one more reason why we need teachers and preachers and tellers of the good news. Perhaps you've been a Christian for a long time, or you always grew up in the church. And if that's the case, then gospel things might sound quite normal to you. But take a moment. There's a great deal of mystery here. For the Colossians, the specific mystery being described, the one hidden for generations but now revealed, is the gospel, the good news that the Jewish Messiah has been extended to fully include Gentiles alongside Jewish believers as equal heirs. Christ is in them now, providing them with the hope of glory which I don't think is just describing an elevated status. If the riches of the glory of this mystery is Christ in you, and that is the hope of glory, and this seems to be communicating God's presence with them, that they are actually partaking of the character of God himself. And if we expand this to think about other aspects of the gospel that are important to us as Christians, many are also a bit of a mystery. Christ dwelling inside of you through the Holy Spirit? And in order for that to happen, you must be born again. And if that is the case, then you are a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. And as a new creation, you belong to the new heavens and the new earth. And so we continue on as citizens of the age to come, living our mortal lives in the here and now as we are being transformed into the image of Christ himself. We need preachers, teachers, and tellers to get to that. It won't come from someone smiling being nice and making polite conversation. 
Now, those things might cause curiosity in someone. They might ask, hey, what is it with you? But then we need to preach, teach, or tell the gospel. What's the content of the preaching, teaching, and telling? Verse 28, him. Him we proclaim. And we've been seeing now for the last couple of weeks that Jesus is all sufficient. He really is all that you need. And if you're involved in some kind of gospel ministry, you must grab a hold of this. And all of us, every one of us, must insist on this in our church. Encourage your pastors and the interns that you will be seeing around here in the coming days. Pray for us to preach Christ-centered sermons from all of the scriptures. You don't need movies, TikTok videos, news headlines, famous quotes from literature, and funny stories. You need the Word of God. And from the Word of God, you need to see Jesus at the center of it all. We live in an information age. It is crazy how readily available the Word of God is to us. But as free and easy and available as it is, many, even most Christians, are painfully, biblically illiterate. And for many, even those who go to church, and they are hit with a crisis, with a tragedy, and they need the word of God. They need an all-sufficient Christ who is preeminent over everything. They reach into their minds and their memories, and all they have is news headlines, their pastor's political commentary, movie clips, and funny stories. Insist on Christ-centered proclamation. Here and in the course of time, whatever church God may call you to, commit to diligently discussing these things as Deuteronomy 6 says within your families and with others in a community group or Bible study. And Paul goes on to say something about his methods, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom. And the word that the ESV has is warning can also mean to admonish, to remind, to call to mind. So this could be warnings for those who are tempted to sin, reproving those who have sinned, or using the gospel to encourage and prompt people to continue on with Christ. There's an example of this in chapter 3, verse 16, when Paul admonishes us to let the word of Christ dwell in us richly, and then says that believers are to Teach and admonish one another. Same two words being used here in verse 28. The teaching would have to do with communicating Christian truth, and the warning and teaching is done with all wisdom. And here, I need to return to something I said just a few moments ago. I said you don't need news headlines, movie clips, clips, famous quotes, or funny stories. But... Movie clips or references, news headlines, quotes from literature, experts, famous individuals, and funny stories can be used in wisdom. Pastor Kennedy and I do this every single week. A pastor may look at his congregation and consider their attention spans, their hurts, their needs, their fears, and so on and then determine to use one of these methods. The key is that the story, the reference, must serve the text to make application, to illustrate, to bring it alive to you, and not that the text is being used to serve the movie quote 
or move on to what the pastor really wants to say. If you remember the funny story, but cannot for the life of you remember what the scripture said, then it didn't work. And it might be because you were distracted. We all need great discernment here. By God's grace, I believe that we have had Christ-centered sermons preached from this pulpit for nearly 70 years. But as we grow, as we talk about planting, as folks may need to move for work, as college students are finding their place in this world, and as you participate in the training and encouraging of interns and missionaries that we will send out from here, encourage and insist on Christ-centered proclamation. We then see the goal of this warning and teaching. It's to present everyone mature in Christ. How do we become mature in Christ? Of course, we can read our Bibles and pray. We can fellowship together and we can serve. These are important things. They're not to be neglected. But none of them exists as an end in themselves. Each of them has a greater purpose, which in the context of Colossians would be the realization of the absolute lordship of Christ over every area of life and even over all existence. The absolute lordship of Christ is essential to gospel proclamation. This idea must be contended with whether you have been a believer your whole life but also if you are not a believer in Jesus. You may often hear the gospel described as the good news that Jesus, the Son of God, has died and risen again. And if you believe in him, he forgives your sins and you go to heaven when you die. But you hear that and you might think, I'm not as bad as all that to need a savior. I'm a good person. Or you find some of the morals of the Bible to be outdated. Better fitting for a more primitive era. And besides, even Christians and churches seem to disagree on these things. But to say that the gospel is just about forgiveness of sins and going to heaven is a truncated gospel. Pay attention to the apostles preaching in the book of Acts and to the writings of the New Testament, and you will see that they do not restrict their preaching to the facts of Jesus' death and resurrection for the forgiveness of sins. They will also stress his absolute lordship in which he possesses all authority in heaven and on earth and will himself judge the living and the dead in true justice and righteousness. And this means that it it does not matter whether we judge ourselves better than our neighbor or not so bad as to need a savior. The mere fact that each one of us seeks to claim autonomy in any area of our life or seeks to judge for ourselves what is right and wrong is a sinful rebellion against Christ's rightful authority and lordship. And this in and of itself means we all need a savior. And so becoming a Christian and continuing on as a Christian involves the continual submission of every area of life to Lord Jesus. I recognize that that idea may be quite uncomfortable probably in every example we have ever seen of rulers claiming absolute authority, it is inevitably the ruler who benefits. But read the New Testament and ask yourself, who benefits from Christ's absolute authority? It is the church. It is his people. So I encourage you, 
claim him as Lord and Savior. He is so good, and he is so worthy. Our third heading is the hard work of gospel ministry. Verse 29 in chapter 2, verse 1. If something is worth living for, it is worth dying for. And it is also worth expending ourselves for, working hard for. In studying for this sermon, I came across a story of a woman in Africa who became a Christian. And out of gratitude for her salvation, she wanted to engage in gospel ministry. But she was blind, uneducated, and already in her 70s. She asked her missionary to underline John 3.16 in her French Bible. And then she took that Bible and she sat in front of a boys' school. When school let out, she would call the boys over and ask if they could read French. And when they proudly said that they could, she would say, please read what is underlined in red. And then she would ask, do you know what this means? And she would tell them about Jesus. That missionary reported that she did this for some time, and it resulted in 24 young men Becoming pastors. What does Paul say here? For this I toil. I work. I put in effort. Struggling. The word is agonizomai. We get agonized from this. I toil agonizing with all his energy that he powerfully works in me. The woman in that story had everything against her. Blind, uneducated, already in her 70s before she started. She couldn't turn boys into pastors, but Christ can. And he delights to do so through people like us. She put in effort, but clearly Christ was working alongside of her. It's the same with Paul. It's the same with you and me. We should be fully engaged in whatever whatever ministry opportunities we have, and yet, at the same time, be always aware that we are completely dependent on Christ and his power working through us. In practical terms, the next time you are asked to participate in some ministry, don't just say, I don't have the skill set for that. What Christ can accomplish through us is not limited by what we think our skill set is. Think of Moses, who protested five times, send somebody else. Gospel ministry is not easy. It takes hard work. There is resistance. And there's also wisdom involved here. Burnout is a real thing. And I think that generally comes when you are doing more than what Christ has called you to, relying on your own strength. It is wise to take stock of ourselves and to run the marathon instead of the sprint. Take time to rest, to stop, to pray, and to be refreshed. Jesus himself did that but engage in the hard work for the gospel, relying on Christ's power at work in you. And finally, the fruit of gospel ministry. As Paul suffers, proclaims, and works hard for the gospel, what fruit is he looking to see? What outcomes? It's that believers' hearts would be encouraged and knit together in love in order to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ. So again, he's struggling that their hearts would be encouraged. And this comes from them being knit together in love. Being knit together in love then allows them to reach full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of Christ. This is a big statement that we need to consider especially in our post-2020 days. Full assurance of understanding and knowledge of Christ will not occur apart from believers' hearts being knit together in love. 
We need this for a host of reasons, of which I'll name just one that is relevant right now. Our culture is increasingly polarized. People are divided, and within the church, we've allowed matters of the world to divide us inside the church. We allow matters of who we vote for and policy differences to divide us. And this is frankly beyond ridiculous. We are members of the same body of Christ, fellow citizens, heirs of the age to come. And we would divide over earthly matters, all of which are passing away, all of which Christ our head is supreme over, all of which will ultimately serve him. Now, this isn't to say that these aren't important, but they cannot be important enough to divide Christ's body. It would be as ridiculous as your left arm going to war with your right leg. And such division will hinder our growth in Christ and our reaching the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of Christ. This is worth our hard work. As a closing application point, how can you engage in gospel ministry? Simply attending and participating in the gathered worship is in fact the most basic gospel ministry that you can engage in. Now, you may need to suffer or face the affliction or sacrifice of songs you don't like. A bad sermon I preach. The person next to you might sing off key. Maybe you'll be feeling you need to give of your financial resources. Or you might even have to sit and listen to someone who seems to complain all the time. They need you. They need your admonishments, your teaching. You don't need to be the preacher. Just sharing biblical truth or wisdom in conversation, offering an answer in a Sunday school class, or praying with someone. And they need your effort, your hard work to engage in worship. Sometimes you go to church and you might not be the best singer, but the person sitting next to you or in front of you, they need to hear you sing because they're grieving a loss. They just got a scary diagnosis from their doctor. They've lost their job. And it was all that they could do to make it here today. They don't have the strength to sing. And so they need to hear you sing like you mean it. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. Because that will remind them and encourage their hearts, giving them assurance that Christ is all sufficient. And he has not left them. Being knit together in love, the unity and fellowship within Christ's body leads to this growing knowledge of Christ as he is, and it is in him that we find all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge hidden in him. It's as a treasure stored up, sufficient to meet all our need. So, Are we willing to suffer for the gospel, to proclaim the gospel, to work hard for the gospel in order that the fruit of the gospel might be born in our own lives, in our local church, our community, and to the ends of the earth? Those are the questions I would like to leave you with today. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we confess that we are more impacted by our culture than we'd like to admit. 
root out of us idols of ease and comfort. Awaken us to the wondrous mystery of the gospel. And may we find it so compelling that we would take risks for the gospel, attempt big things for the gospel, even stretch beyond what we think is possible, not because we have skills or smarts or resources, but struggling with your energy that you work in us. As Paul will soon instruct us, may we set our minds on things above and not allow earthly passing things to divide us, but being knit together in love, may we reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of the mystery of Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen.